Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction and for inviting me here today. It's really an honor to come here to the Karolinska and to your country, as you are the world leaders in the fields of interest to me particularly, mm. both psychiatry and epidemiology, and also the integration of genetics and epidemiology, which is what I'm going to be talking about um, later in my comments today. So today I'm going to be speaking about three major topics. First, I'll summarize the contributions of epidemiology um, to chronic diseases and to psychiatry. Secondly, I'm going to talk about the challenges that face us in the new era of neuroscience and um, molecular genetics and how we can most um, profitably combine those tools to gain understanding of human diseases. And third, to discuss some future directions and raise questions about what might be the most uh, promising directions for the future of combining the tools of our various disciplines as we move into the next decade. So thank you very much for presenting the background on epidemiology. It, it saves me a couple of slides here because when when we go to meetings, if we speak at universities or places that people are not familiar with epidemiology, people really don't know what epidemiology is. And I still think there's the common belief that there's such a thing as an epidemiologic study, meaning it's a population-based study. And that's actually not the case. There, aren't, there isn't one particular epidemiologic type study. And furthermore, there's not really a body of knowledge in epidemiology. Rather, epidemiology is a set of tools to study causation of diseases and to identify risk factors so that we can prevent human diseases at the level of the population. So we go through various phases uh, to begin to build the scaffolding for understanding causes, multifactorial causes of human disease, and then to identify the most promising area where we might be able to intervene or to prevent the incidence of disease, and for those who already suffer from these conditions, to prevent the consequences of those conditions. And we have a very broad view. We're interested in public health. So when we tally our scorecards, we want to know how well have we done at preventing human diseases and also of minimizing their consequences. So to review some of the consequences in psychiatric epidemiology, I'm going to show you an overview of what has been called the three stages of epidemiology. And now we've been moving into a fourth stage. There's numerous reviews of the history of psychiatric epidemiology that I think are, are very um, comprehensive. And they do build the story of the world and how we put our tools together globally to understand mental illness and its definitions and its manifestations and consequences. But generally, uh, we think of the era before the 1950s as the area where the era when we studied the social roots of mental illness. So for the last 50 years prior to that, people were interested in societal causes of mental disorders and focused on social class, urbanization, um, and social stress, and these kinds of factors, um, as well as things like infection, nutrition, and so forth, which interestingly we're beginning to come back to now as we start to examine the risk factors for psychosis and for some of the major mental disorders. But this era really looked more at the broad picture of the society and how it was related to the development of mental disorders and how there was differential distribution by some of these social factors. We then moved into an era of descriptive epidemiology, and that's the era that pre predominantly uh, what occurred over the last 30 years across the world. And in a few moments, I can show you some of the culmination of that work where we're beginning to communicate across the world globally to try to understand the problems of mental illness, the definitions across different cultures, both developing and developed cultures, 
So that, that era, I think, has been one of the major success stories of our field. And of course, we started that field with the limitations of how we define psychiatric disorders. And our field proceeds in parallel to developments in psychiatry. So we're somewhat limited by our diagnostic nomenclature, and hence, we have great interest in the DSM-5 because we want to know what we're going, we're going to have to do to change our instruments and change our tools to adapt to changes that may emanate from the various work groups in the United States, but also with the, the new versions of the ICD. Also, trends in research on treatment and causality also somewhat drive our field, because as we moved into the era of neuroscience and genetics, that has predominated our field of psychiatry, and hence epidemiologists have had to adapt and to try to learn how to integrate some of this progress into our large population-based studies, as well as small, more defined case control studies. So we're now moving into the era of risk factor epidemiology, and I would recommend a new textbook by Ezra Susser and colleagues that came out about two years ago that is a very rich compilation of the history, the methods of epidemiology in general and psychiatric epidemiology in particular. And it addresses all of the issues that I'm going to be raising today, but builds a very nice conceptual basis for helping us to think of how we will move forward in the future. The third phase of epidemiology, according to Susser and his colleagues' nomenclature, is called eco-epidemiology where we're going to be building sets of risk factors, correlates, across developmental life stages. And that's one of the new developments that we're trying to look across the lifespan, moving as early as birth and early risk factors that occur very early in life, as those of you are doing here, all the way to the other end of the lifespan. So in the next few moments, I'd like to review some of these achievements briefly and then move on to talk about some of the challenges in our field. So I think one of the major achievements in our field um, has been the development of a common set of diagnostic tools so that when a paper comes out of the Karolinska or Sweden and they describe in the methods section how they assessed particular disorder, I, sitting in another part of the world, can understand how it was done, what, what questions were asked, how the tools were applied to make psychiatric diagnoses, to apply the diagnostic nomenclature of the day. Those of us who have been involved in psychiatric epidemiology over the last 30 years realize that we've moved from the DSM-3 to 3R to 4, then to 4, um, four modified 4, for TR and now to DSM-5. So when you're doing longitudinal studies, as many people are here, it's quite a challenge to adapt to these different cut points and thresholds for mental disorders. One of my major teachers in psychiatry was Professor Jules Angst in Switzerland, who I think is another hero of our field because he was aware back in the late 1970s that without population-based samples, and without systematic follow-up across the lifespan, we were never going to be able to achieve a diagnostic nomenclature that really taps the changes in diagnostic uh, features of these conditions over time. So he began the Zurich Cohort Study in 1978. Uh, there have been now six follow-ups over 40 years. But what was different about this study is there is very rich information on the core features of a range of psychiatric conditions as well as medical conditions. So that study has enabled us to look at disorders that are not even in mainstream psychiatry, such as migraine, where we can look at changes in symptoms and clusters of symptoms across the lifespan. And this has raised major questions about the diagnostic nomenclature for migraine uh, because of such wonderful data that we can study over time. Some of the other ad advances have been these population surveys, which we are all aware of those limitations, um, particularly now in the United States, 
where it's very difficult to go into households, and particularly those of us who are from the federal government, knock on the door and have people tell us their income, tell us about what they think about, tell us about their behavior, um, substance use, and so forth. So that has been quite a challenge for many of us with changes in the popular views of what this information might be used for. Um, in fact, now people don't even have landlines at home, so our telephone surveys are now highly biased uh, because many people uh, have only mobile phones so that when we use telephone sampling, we no longer uh, can collect unbiased samples of the population in our country. These are some of the methodologic challenges that many of us are trying to resolve, um, not only in the US, but across the world. Now, I'll show you some examples of these pop the results of these population surveys and the results of one of the largest, which actually um, has recently been completed over the last uh, three years to put together some of the data across the um, entire world. I think one of the major findings in many of the population-based surveys across the world was is that the majority of people who suffer from mental disorders do, do not get treatment. And in our country, there's a growing gap between the people who actually get to the specialty of psychi psychiatry and psychology and those people who are treated in primary care medicine. So it used to be that somebody with bipolar disorder or severe psychosis would invariably end up either in a hospital or in a specialty psychiatric setting. But in the last five to six years, we've seen that difference go away. And now the majority of people with some of these very severe disorders are not being seen in specialty psychiatric settings. So as epidemiologists, where we are very concerned about biases of the samples who we study, who we bring in to our clinics or into our imaging facilities and our sleep centers, um, it's extremely important that we understand what those biases are so that ultimately our findings can be generalized to the population at large. And thus, that's become a very important task for many of us because we can no longer rely on the samples who come <laughs> to our, uh, our psychiatric specialty settings and really must go back out to the population, to primary care, and to other fields of medicine uh, where these people are receiving their care. The burden of mental disorders um, is an extremely important finding over the last decade when the World Health Organization came up with the concept of disability adjusted life years. And I'll show you some interesting findings about the burden of mental disorders that I think has really helped us um, in many countries to convey to the public the importance of mental disorders, that they are omnipresent. They are not limited to only certain classes of people, that they affect most people um, in some way. Even if they aren't affected themselves, they affect their families, they affect the workplace. So I think that's been an important message that we've had to convey to the public so that they don't have the fear of mental illness and a lack of understanding of what the consequences and the manifestations of illness are. And finally, one of the most important findings that I think emerged partly from changes in the diagnostic nomenclature when we started to really characterize some groups of disorders was the concept of comorbidity. And when I was at Yale as a graduate student, that's when we first started to use that term, which was borrowed from the field of chronic disease epidemiology by Alvin Feinstein, who was concerned about secondary conditions of people who are participating in clinical trials. So if people were in clinical trials for heart disease and they had diabetes, the results could be quite different than if people didn't have the secondary condition. It said nothing about whether there were common causes of that comorbidity or not. It was only to characterize people according to multiple conditions that they may have across their lifetime. And I think this has been one of the most important findings in psychiatry because we see that the co-occurrence of disorders is more common than the lack of or having a single disorder. 
So what does that mean? Is it a problem in our nomenclature, or does it help us to better characterize subgroups of people? And I'll comment on that in a moment as well. So to move on to some of the global population-based studies, I'd like to call your attention to a study called the World, uh, the World Mental Health Surveys that has been in evolution over the last decade. The flagship study for this was the National Comorbidity Survey Replication that was, um, it was developed by Ronald Kessler at Harvard. And over time, the diagnostic instrument that was used for that study, the Composite International Diagnostic Interview, the CD, known well to many of you, which was developed by a group at the World Health Organization mm -hmm. to try to reconcile the DSM criteria with the ICD criteria, has been developed and translated to multiple countries across the world. So these are the countries that are now uh, included in the World Mental Health Survey. They've recently conducted surveys now in Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and some of the countries in the Middle East as well. So this has been growing across the world um, with the tie that holds people together is the same diagnostic interview and systematic sampling of populations. So many of you may be aware of some of the papers that have emanated from this study. Uh, there are two books that have been published. One that I think is very interesting on comorbidity of mental and physical conditions across the world. And I think that's very important because we tend to see patterns of comorbidity both within psychiatric or mental disorders and physical conditions tend to be the same throughout the world, even though we have dramatic differences in our base rates. So this is a slide that shows the rates of major depression across the world. And it's very interesting here. We, first, we don't have any Nordic countries in the World Mental Health initiative. And I think this was partly because you already have collected data on your populations in many ways. And I have a slide that shows all of the rich data, the different approaches that have been used here that have been built into your society for more than 100 years. So in the United States, we had very limited data on population um, health at all. So these studies that began with sampling of local regions of the United States with the epidemiologic catchment area study. Uh, we could use sampling statistics to generalize to the population, but the National Comorbidity Survey was the first to actually sample the U.S. as an aggregate entity. So these studies then, starting with the U.S., um, had gone through the, through the rest of the world and as I said, now are, there are data being collected in many of the developing countries in uh, the Middle East and Africa. But what's amazing here is if we look at the lifetime prevalence of major depression, we see that the rates in the United States, France, New Zealand, and Netherlands, the European countries and the United States, they're the highest rates of depression. And then when we go to Nigeria and the People's Republic of China, the rates are the lowest. And of course, this raises a lot of questions about cultural factors, methodologic factors, um, sampling factors, mistakes in our diagnostic algorithms, which is always the first thing we think of, mistakes in our interview, differences, and so forth. But it turns out that these differences are probably somewhat real, that we do have higher rates of depression in some of these countries than we do in, in Asian countries and in African countries but the differences are not as widespread as we see here. So I think there's going to be a lot of work to try to understand the language that we're using, the cultural interpretations of the questions, and the stigma attached to these conditions that leads people to deny that they have these conditions when we're doing community sampling studies in countries that have not really had the opportunity to do this kind of work on a widespread basis. I also wanted to, to raise the issue of the importance of bringing children into our studies of the magnitude, the burden, and the risk factors, mental disorders. This is a summary of studies of children, population-based studies of mental disorders in children across the world by Jane Costello. And this study 
her analysis was a meta-analysis of studies, primarily in Europe and in the United States, and some uh, studies in, in um, New Zealand and Australia, which also has a fairly rich tradition of collecting population-based work. In the United States, until recently, we have not had any population-based sampling of mental disorders in children or adolescents. So we recently have completed a study, the National Comorbidity Survey Adolescent Extension, where we have interviewed children down to age 13 using the same tools as we did for adults, but adapted to capture the early manifestations of these conditions as they emerge in adolescence. We also have some nationwide data on mental disorders in children as young as age eight and up using a highly structured diagnostic interview called the DISC, the Diagnostic Interview Survey for Children. So these, these findings are beginning to emerge and we find that the differences in the rates are primarily attributable to the tools that we use. So depending on how the structure of the tools, the thresholds and so forth, our rates can vary dramatically. However, there is a lack of agreement among child psychiatrists, psychologists, other mental health professionals, and epidemiologists about the best ways to capture these conditions as they emerge in adolescence. And thus, I think the next, over the next decades, moving our surveys down to this age range when many of these conditions begin before they start to crystallize in early adulthood is going to be a very important challenge that I think is going to I th be very fruitful in our addressing some of the sources of complexity that we see when we see people who have already started to suffer from these conditions in mid to late adulthood. To bring home the issue about comorbidity, I have an example slide here of our study of bipolar spectrum disorder in the national uh, population of the US. And I wanted to show you that only 8% of those in the US adult population who meet criteria for bipolar disorder only have bipolar disorder. By contrast, 70% of those, and this is in the population without respect to people having sought treatment, 70% of those people have three or more other mental disorders across the lifespan. Many of us have studied the evolution of these conditions, and now I think there's compelling data that bipolar illness is associated with the, a, a major consequence of substance use disorders, and substance abuse. And the younger we start to identify people who start to have episodes of mania, fluctuating with episodes of depression, we see that early on, many of these people start to use alcohol and drugs, although we can't say that it is self-medication, but it appears to follow the onset of the condition, particularly when people are in the manic or somewhat agitated phase of their condition. So many of us have moved down to focus on the early underpinnings of sub-threshold manifestations of these conditions because this is a rate limiting step for many of the studies that we do in our laboratories, that includes neuroimaging, genetics, if we bring people in and we say they meet lifetime criteria or even current criteria for bipolar one or two, they're likely to have suffered from many different conditions. Uh, in addition to substance abuse, we're learning more about the core role of anxiety in the development of bipolar disorder. The high-risk studies from Canada and others who have started to follow offspring of people with bipolar illness are now showing that many of the offspring of people with bipolar illness begin to manifest social phobia and anxiety states in adolescence before you ever see episodes of major depression. So by taking such a life course perspective using this design, that we can start to understand why we have this condition where people tend to suffer from pervasive <coughs> comorbidity, indicating pervasive disturbances in multiple systems, the fear, anxiety system, the cognitive system, as well as mood and affect and stress reactivity. So this, I think this is going to be where we're going to be moving in the future.
if we start to examine the evolution of these conditions. So this, I think, is not only a problem with what we are studying in general population samples and where we count such people, but also it's providing clues for us for the future as we start to understand, to try to understand the underpinnings of these conditions. So finally, in terms of the global burden of disease, this paper came out by Martin Prince and his colleagues in The Lancet. And I think, this, I think these findings have really helped us, particularly those of us who are epidemiologists or genetic epidemiologists, who tend to sit in rooms with people who are experts in cardiovascular disease, cancer, and neurology. Because many people do not understand the extent to which neuropsychiatric disorders explain the burden of illness across society. The title of the paper by Prince was, I think, a very striking title, No Health Without Mental Health. Because people looked at these statistics in disbelief when we showed that 90 or 28% of the burden, the global burden of disease in adults across developing countries uh, for non-communicable diseases is explained by neuropsychiatric disorders. That it was more than cardiovascular disease, and that actually should be 22%. Um, in the publication, it says 2%. Um, and then other diseases, such as respiratory disease, digestive and musculoskeletal diseases, and so forth. And the reason for this appears to be that mental disorders strike early in adult life, the majority of them. And they tend to be chronic. Whereas many of these other conditions, though they're related to increased mortality, they tend to occur later in life. So when we look at the absolute number of life years that people suffer from these conditions, they're not nearly as large as those of someone who develops psychosis at an early age in their early 20s and then goes through a downward trend across their lifespan. So this is the major reason that it appears that the neuropsychiatric disorders, and here I'm including such things as epilepsy, migraine, and some of the other so-called neurologic diseases that also tend to strike in early adult life and tend to have chronic or at least waxing and waning courses. So the final stage of, of psychiatric epidemiology is the stage that I refer to as risk factor or eco epidemiology. And some of the vulnerability factors that have emerged from studies in epidemiology, and particularly here, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, I put together a list of some of the important studies that have emerged from your country and other cohort studies and population-based studies across the world. Uh, we knew that these factors were associated with a range of different mental disorders for a long time from retrospective case control studies. But now the prospective evidence is starting to emerge, both here in your department and in others. And I think these are providing very important leads that provide clues to the underlying biology and to the environmental inputs to these conditions. I also want to point out that the major risk factor the most important risk factor, if we have only one, if we can only choose one, the major risk factor for most of the chronic diseases, almost all, but I, I never say all, is a family history of that condition. Because somebody is sitting here studying autism um, that, that doesn't apply to autism because we don't see vertical transmission of autism in families. So the question is, what is going on if there are genes underlying it? How are those genes expressed in the parents of children um, who suffer from autism. So when I put together the registries, the twin, the, the very um, the wonderful Swedish twin registry, and some of the treatment registries uh, reviewed recently by somebody from your department, um, Peter Olebeck, and in my field of migraine, Bo Bile from Sweden, has done probably the most important longitudinal study of migraine in school children that has ever been conducted. He followed up these children 40 years later. And some of the risk factors he identified then help us to predict who's going to go on to develop chronic headache and who is going to have this only for a short time in li their life and then they will not progress further. Um, also, his work uh, 
pointed to some of the sex differences in the manifestation of migraine and the spectrum of headache conditions over time. We, of course, have the classic Lundby cohort study. Any of us who teach psychiatric epidemiology in schools of public health uh, will talk about the Lundby study. When I taught psychiatric epidemiology at Yale, I would find the um, supplements to Acta Psychiatrica Scandinavica and distribute them to students to read the rich work that was oftentimes done by one person who was completing a dissertation, oftentimes a medical doctor who lived in a certain area and went out and interviewed everybody by him or herself. And these studies, the findings from these studies still stand up today. If we go back to Essen Muller's study and we look at some of the physical symptoms that it predicted later mental disorders, we, we are now confirming many of those observations in our very expensive population-based cohort studies today. So this rich tradi tradition, I think, also changes our thinking, both in medicine and specifically in psychiatry, about the blurred boundaries between disorders and the evolution of these conditions over time. Okay, now to move to the second part of my talk to discuss some of the challenges that we face in epidemiology, in genetics, which can be seen as a subdiscipline of epidemiology, although my geneticist colleagues, um, particularly molecular geneticists, would not agree with this. Um, but if we consider genes as risk factors, then it certainly does fall within our domain, at least in part, and then finally psychiatry. And our challenges are interrelated. So our rate limiting step is progression in psychiatry in terms of diagnostic nomenclature, treatment, and understanding of the pathogenesis of diseases. So I wanted to step back a moment and just talk about some of the problems that epidemiology has been facing. And I don't know if people have seen this headline in, this headline was in Science, and it led Neil Risch and me to say, whoa, you know, this, this person, Taubes, was making a very important point. And that is, he was concerned about the overinterpretation of associations from population-based cohort studies, where, where there were associations that were not specified in advance. And they found associations between estrogen and intake and um, declined risk of heart disease or Alzheimer's, or between certain dietary agents and heart disease. But these studies were not designed to address these questions. They were, they were incidental findings from these studies that people look back at the studies and then looked at these associations over time. So before they were replicated carefully in other cohort studies or in nested case control studies, these findings were immediately translated to the population. And the entire population of the world, actually, was put on low-fat diets, um, we were taught about dietary factors in the prevention of colon cancer. Uh, people, women were encouraged to take estrogens to prevent cognitive decline and osteoporosis and so forth. So there was a huge translation from this kind of work to population public health. Of course, that is the challenge of our field. More recently, Talbis um, has an article in the New York Times, again, doing a much more comprehensive review of this work and being quite critical of the direct translation of these findings to public health and to the press. So as people pick up the newspaper and they see what's good for you and what's bad for you, it changes almost weekly. So people who use the press to decide what they're going to do if they do follow these kinds of prescriptions uh, have been very stymied by these lack of consistency of findings. Now, why have these, why has this condition emerged? Well, mm -hmm. these risk factors haven't been confirmed. They may be, uh, they may be results of confounders in these studies. It may be how we're measuring the findings. There, may, there are numerous reasons for the lack of replication of these findings. And in fact, when there have been clinical trials in the field of cancer, for example, where there have been random assignments assignment to certain dietary agents and then cohorts have been followed over time. The findings have emerged that the, the people who were supposedly in the case group, that were supposed to 
have a diet protective against cancer actually had more incidence of cancer. So the findings were not only confirmed in other studies, but the studies that were done where these were actually translated into interventions also did not confirm the findings from our earlier studies. So what was the problem with some of these? Well, the problem is that people look at these risk factors in a vacuum. They look at one risk factor at a time. They look at diet, but they don't look at the whole profile of risk factors, which, as you are beginning to demonstrate for the risk factors for schizophrenia, for example, that there are multiple factors that are associated with the risk of disease. And changing one of those, when we don't understand the pathogenesis, may not only not prevent the disease, it may actually lead to a shift in physiology or behavior that may actually increase your risk of disease. So we have to be very cautious in interpreting these kinds of associations before we apply them to public health practice. Now, on the other side of this issue is the field of genetics. So in many of these studies, it's absolutely amazing if you go back and look at these cohort studies and inspect them, that they didn't even collect data on a family history of a disease. So if we look at many of these studies, we see that for the studies of diet, the studies of endogenous estrogen, so forth, the questions were not even included in the cohort about whether the person had a family history of that condition. And that family history of conditions is still, as I said, one of the most important predictors of the risk to an individual. So if you have a particular disorder in your family lineage, your risk of that disorder goes up by a, a whole range of, of uh, magnitude depending on the characteristics of your relative, the age of onset of the condition, the sex of the person, the subtype of the disease, and so forth. So that has really helped us to refine the risk estimates and start to put them together, as I'm going to say um, at the end of my uh, talk today. Now, I think many people have seen this um, with the mapping of the human genome in 2003. Uh, there was a lot of promissory notes put out there. It was like the mortgage situation in the United States. Um, there was a lot of excitement generated by the spectacular advances in molecular biology. And to date, and I have a few, um, uh, a few slides that can show you what has been uh, the source of consternation to geneticists, because people were so excited by the opportunities of the mapping of the human genome, of our ability to identify genes in populations, that we overestimated the ability of these studies to predict risk of diseases in the general population. At least many of us did. Uh, the whole field didn't go this direction. But it was expected that as we move to identify genes, uh, that we would be able to then quickly translate them to treatment and prevention, which we were unsuccessful in doing in epidemiology as well. So we all know about genome-wide association studies. It's not in the dictionary, but people will talk to me about GWAS. And, at first, I didn't know what they were talking about. It's become a new term in, in the, at least in English. I don't know if you have a definite, uh, I guess you call it GWAS too. I don't know with a Swedish accent. But uh, I think what's been exciting about progress in genomics has been that the genes for nearly all of the Mendelian diseases are those that we knew the mode of transmission, either autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, or the sex-linked disorders, have been identified. And I think we've been humbled by the findings because we, who would have anticipated that many of these diseases, these autosomal dominant diseases, were really a, um, they were complex in that they were quantitative traits, such as Huntington's disease, such as some of the other diseases as Marfan's disease, where we actually know the gene, we know what it does, it's a connective tissue gene, um, but we don't know why some people have pectus excavatum and other people grow, have, have, are very tall or have skeletal anomalies. So we know the gene, but we can't predict which features that individuals who harbor this gene are going to manifest. It doesn't even look to be strongly familial. So I think what this has done is made us really have a quite sobering experience about the complexity of these processes. <clears throat> 
Now for the genome-wide association studies where we moved out to the population and we started to look at the variants that were, were more difficult to identify because they had small, smaller effects. Since these studies have emerged, the case control mm -hmm. genome-wide approach has emerged, there are now more than 350 gene variants for about 100 diseases that have been identified. So the numbers keep climbing as we stand here today. There have been 25 variants that have been replicated for diabetes type 2. There's 10 for breast cancer, that the non-autosomal dominant forms of breast cancer. And then there's a question about a couple of new possible genes for Alzheimer's disease, some of the work which has actually been done here in Sweden. So besides the APOE uh, gene that we've known about for a long time, there are a couple new candidates that look like they may be associated with the onset of uh, late onset Alzheimer's diseases. However, in psychiatry, it has been, there, it's been, there have been few association studies of candidate genes that have stood the test of replication. Uh, I think this paper lays out what constitutes a replication, and almost none of the studies, either within or outside of psychiatry, meet all the criteria. We were held to very high standards when we met to decide what is a replication here, but we should all aspire to have real replications of our findings rather than stratifying our data multiple ways until we get a replication, which is what has been happening in many of the purported replications of particularly candidate gene studies um, in, for chronic diseases. So we've had few successes, and we can argue about what some of the successes are and which ones have stood the test of replication and so forth. But the point is psychiatry has not had the same progress that we have in other fields, and the question is, well, why is that? Well, other fields, are, are also suffering from the same kind of consternation about how do we apply these genes um, to public health and to prevent disease. So you saw for diabetes type 2, for example, that there's now 25 risk variants. But the studies that have attempted to look at these common variants and to predict risk in new samples have been abysmal fa failures. Groups that have started to investigate how, how much these genes predict in terms of the risk of disease by using such statistics as the C statistic area under the curve, how well do these genetic risk factors, these SNPs, or even genes for which we know function, how well did they help us to predict risk of disease? Or more recently, some studies that have been looking at how do we predict the course of breast cancer using some of these genes that have been kind of incontrovertibly accepted by people in the field? And the sad story is that they really haven't helped us very much in being able to predict risk in populations. Now, why is this the fact? Well, partly because we haven't been very good at integrating studies from population-based studies of environmental exposures that may be necessary or sufficient for expression of these underlying genes. And I think, keeping with the, the example of diabetes, I think this was a really important example where we see that the Pima Indians in Arizona, who moved originally from Mexico, who are genetically identical, because uh, they have the DNA from samples of, of Pima Indians in Mexico and also in the U.S., and these genes, the frequencies, have not changed in one or two generations. Yet we see that the risk of diabetes has gone from 2% in one generation to 50% in those residing on these reservations in the U.S. These studies, um, by using the tools of epidemiology, are now honing in on the dramatic change in lifestyle where the Pimas moved from an agrarian lifestyle with which they had a lot of physical activity and low-fat diets, low-sugar diets, to, uh, to a basically a lifestyle that was typical of the American lifestyle without a lot of physical activity. And much of the increase this dramatic increase in diabetes type 2 prevalence in these people has been attributed to the lack of physical activity. 
when they've started to look at these risk factors together. And hence, I think the question is, if we have all these risk markers that are very low, have low attributable risk or population attributable risk as we move to population, how do we put them together with these kind of environmental exposures? As many of you have begun to do in the twin studies um, indirectly, now by actually measuring specific environmental factors and specific genes, I think the challenge is how do we put those together? Well, this slide shows how uh, one of, I think, one of the important examples of how we can start to think in these directions before I move us back to psychiatry and talk about our challenges. So this is a paper that was, uh, which attempted to compare the risk of some of the well-established risk factors for diabetes that had been identified both in case control and cohort studies across the world. So these risk factors, known as clinical risk factors, family history, and then the first few genes that were identified for diabetes type 2. So the first finding here, I think, that jumps out at us is diabetes in the family is the major predictor. You have a threefold risk of the prediction of diabetes in the relatives of people who suffer from diabetes type 2. As we add these other risk factors to the equation, they also give us increase in ability to predict whether a person's going to develop diabetes type 2. Now, many of the studies that have added SNPs or looked at the SNPs alone, such as those for breast cancer, when they put those 10 genes together side by side to see if they can predict breast cancer risk, what they found here, though, is that these genes actually do add to the risk equation. And I think the reason that they do, these two add increased risk, and the PPRG is it's protective against the development of diabetes. But when we add these up, I think an important lesson is being learned from my colleagues in the cancer field and the fields where they really do have a large number of genes that, that they can use to examine how they work together, is that most of these effects seem to be additive. Mm -hmm. When they add the population-based risk factors, that are environmental or clinical, and they start to add them to the genetic findings, it looks like there's very few examples of gene-environment interaction or epistasis, which is something we've all been concerned about. We develop our studies to look for gene-environment interaction because we assume it's there. But most of these studies have shown that the more of these risk factors you have, whether they be compilation of all these SNPs, whether they be environmental, they tend to add up. And of course, family history is really not an independent risk factor because what is running in the family is probably your response to glucose or blood pressure or lifestyle and so forth. So what family history does, it absorbs both the environmental risk and the genetic risk. So it helps us to predict who's going to develop the disease. So if our goal is prediction or prevention, then that even down the road from now when we know a lot more about genetic architecture, family history may still outweigh what we learn from basic science and from genetics. OK, and finally, um, when we talk about challenges, before I go on to, um, to talk about some of the directions for our future in psychiatry, this paper, I think, also shows the importance of family history of diabetes type 2 by Peter Kraft and a group of colleagues at Harvard and also at the National Cancer Institute as well as colleagues in Britain. If we look at people without type 2 diabetes of family history, we see that their risk, you can compare the average risk depending on the number of risk alleles that they have. So we have 15 alleles as the black line. And you'll note that nobody with a, who does not have a family history has that many alleles for diabetes. That's, therefore, the family history is somewhat explained by the genes, which, of course, makes sense. So if you look at the risk of people who have eight or more alleles, that's the gray line, the risk of developing diabetes is about 2% population risk. Whereas here, if they have a positive family history and they have 15 more alleles, the risk goes up to between 10 and 15%. But it's nowhere near something that we'd like to write home ab about that we could actually start to do interventions that would be powerful. We, we need very large sample sizes, even if we were to do nested studies. 
um, in uh, those with a positive family history. So I'm going to, I think, urge us in our field to continue the basic tools of genetic epidemiology that were used over the last 200 years to identify what genes do in families, and that is to go back to family studies, to go back to see how do these diseases run across generations. Because family studies are perhaps the most powerful approach we have, if used alone, to estimate risk, as I've just described, to examine the genetic architecture of diseases, and to dissect our phenotypes. So to move forward into psychiatry, I want to talk about some of the challenges in psychiatry and how we can apply the tools not only of family studies, but epidemiology, and particularly genetic epidemiology, that might help us to, to take advantage of some of the advantage of advances in neuroscience and psychiatry. So the decade of the brain, and those of us who were here at the time remember the decade of the brain, and I kept saying during the 90s, what happens in 2000 um, after the decade of the brain? Are we going to continue to learn more about the brain, or where are, we going to, where are we going next? And of course, we learned a lot about the brain, but I think those engaged in neuroscience have also been humbled to the same extent that we in basic genetics and epidemiology have been humbled. Because the more we learn about the brain, the more we learn about its complexity. And we appreciate that there are not simple pathways. We don't have three sets of neurotransmitters. One neurotransmitter hooked to each of the major disorders, dopamine to schizophrenia, serotonin to depression, and the neurodynergic system anxiety. It just doesn't work that way. The regulatory systems, the interplay of experience, environmental factors, and so forth, is so complicated that I think appreciation of that complexity is going to be very important as we develop tools and we move together to try to reap the benefits of advances in basic science and to move them into psychiatry. But I think many of us have been pushed by the terms bench to bedside, translational medicine, when perhaps in our field we're just not there yet. We're not ready. This kind of progress, these advances, are very important in their own just for understanding biology, understanding the human brain, uh, human functioning. And for those kinds of advances, uh, they win the Nobel Prize. They come here and win the Nobel Prize. So the question is, how can these kinds of spectacular advances be used to help us out in the public, in public health? How can we take these advantages and advances to help us to treat, to prevent mental disorders. So I don't know those of you who have seen this. This was a rather amusing article to many of us because it had pictures of the proponents in genetics and psychiatry in the big debate where one of the psychiatrists who's studying genes for different neuroimaging parameters said, geneticists just don't understand psychiatry. And one of the psychiatrists, or one of the geneticists was saying, well, psychiatrists just don't understand genetics. And so it's this back and forth about what are the best ways to identify genes. By doing neuroimaging, can we identify the genes underlying these pathways in the brain? Can that help us to bring forward our knowledge about the transmission of disorders across generations? And of course, they're probably both right. Um, I think if we look at successes in the applications of integrated medicine for other diseases, where have we had success? Well, we've had success if there's a priori knowledge of the biologic pathways. This has been particularly true for candidate gene studies. If we have a priori knowledge of the pathways, then we've been much more successful in picking candidates that, that make sense. If we have valid and reliable phenotype measures, and I think that's still our rate limiting step, we still, as we move to DSM-5, and I'm not sure where we'll be, uh, a decade from now, it, it, we are still in the dark ages. It is still very primitive, our ability to look at humans who come in with conditions or even those we identify in the population and to really characterize the core features of diseases, 
and to separate those from each other. So, where do epidemiologists fall in the future? Well, this slide was, of course, in the New Yorker many years ago as a joke. So why would you invite an epidemiologist to a party when you have Lady Gaga, you know, we have all these famous movie stars and so forth. Bringing an epidemiologist to a party isn't something people think about when they're checking off the composition of who they're bringing to their parties. My argument is, well, maybe they should. Maybe we do need to bring the tools of epidemiology to neuroscience instead of going in a unidirectional fashion from bench to bedside. I think we have to have much more crosstalk between what we learn in populations and by dealing with the challenge that we have in trying to go out there and treat people with mental disorders to prevent the illness. And I'm always uh, challenged by calls that we get at the NIH and other places by people saying, my, my relative was doing very well, but we can't afford the medicine anymore. We can't pay for their medicine. We can't get them to take their medicine. My family is completely disrupted, and we just don't know how to bring it back together. And at the same time, we're spending millions and millions of dollars doing sequencing, neuroimaging, all the studies that we do, which will certainly help us understand more about the underpinnings. But how do we balance this with the current situation in psychiatry where we really don't have many new treatments? We don't have many new findings that we can actually translate to the public. Now, and I don't think that that speaks against the progress or the expense of devotion of resources into basic science. But I think we have to understand how primitive we are in understanding the diseases and how important it is that we do something simultaneously and in parallel to also pay attention to the public health mission of epidemiology and psychiatry by learning how to bring these tools together. So what are the future directions? And for the sake of time, and so we can have questions um, at the end, I'm going to go through these relatively quickly, because I don't have the answers. And when I started to put this together, I really don't have the answers. Um, but I think if we work together and we have forum, like you're this lecture series where you're bringing people together who are talking about DSM-5, other people who are talking about the neuroscience of delusions and hallucinations. I think by much more crosstalk, where basic scientists, molecular geneticists, understand the public health aspects, understand epidemiology, some of the, the work in psychology, in cultural anthropology, and so by bringing this together, that we can have a common forum for communication. So what are some of the things we can do? Well, we still need to try to understand the core features of diseases and the processes underlying them. And I know much of the leading work in the world is going on here, looking at the core features of, of youth who will eventually develop schizophrenia, psychoses. The same with sleep. We're beginning to look at circadian rhythms and mood disorders. We're looking at fear and anxiety and the underlying mechanisms of fear and anxiety and trying to apply those to human and go back and forth. We also need to go back, as I said, to family studies because we can assume that within families or discordant monozygotic twins, particularly those discordant for environmental exposures, the study designs that you're very familiar with, where we can actually design studies of these specific exposures and let the genetics vary and so forth may help us to move forward in not only advancing the diagnostic nomenclature and its validity and its ability to translate, but also our understanding of how these risk factors work together. And finally, uh, Lena Peltonen, who unfortunately uh, is deceased last March, I don't know if people were aware of that, one of the leading geneticists who came to the United States to UCLA to lead a program in genetics only to move back to Finland because she realized if we don't go to big population surveys, the tools of human genetics in which she was a real leading world expert will never be brought to bear.
so she went back to Finland to begin to take advantage of the resources that you have in your countries with these population registries, with the ability to follow people, with the cohorts, because that's the only way that we're going to be able to solve these, the complex diseases that um, form the basis of psychiatry. And also to leave you with one lingering note, it is possible that we may not, never understand these disorders in terms of a comprehensive view of risk factors, but at least we can make an attempt as men do to understand women. Thank you.